Hello, my name is Susan Goldberg. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of National Geographic, and I'm joined today by Walter Isaacson, renowned author and professor at Tulane University. And Walter has just written a fascinating new book. Uh, the title is called The Code Breaker, the tale of Jennifer Doudna, CRISPR, and the future of the human race. Walter, I'm so glad you could join me. Thank you so much, Susan, and thanks for all you're doing at National Geographic. It's a great, great 130-year-old institution. Well, thank you. You know, I was so interested that you were doing this book because you've written all kinds of amazing, amazing books about people from Steve Jobs to, you know, Leonardo da Vinci, uh, you know, Albert Einstein, uh, Benjamin Franklin. I would guess that most people have never heard of Jennifer Doudna. So tell me why you decided to write about her. Well, first of all, people are going to hear about her because she and some of her colleagues invented the gene editing technology called CRISPR, which means that in the future, our biggest scientific advance, but in some ways our biggest moral challenge will be, how much do we edit our genes? Do we edit the genes of our children? Do we make them taller or smarter? All these things we're gonna be able to do with genetic engineering technology. She's also a wonderful character. You know, She's an exemplar of somebody who loves basic science but then is able, is able to translate it into tools that we can use. And especially during this COVID crisis, the biotechnology of things like CRISPR are what's going to save us. It's going to be able to create tools that will allow us to attack viruses because that's what CRISPR is. It was a system that bacteria developed more than 3 billion years ago in order to fend off viruses. So I find well, I that topic very exciting. It is exciting, and I know that the FDA has just approved sort of a, an emergency uh, way that, that CRISPR could be used to do a test for COVID. How is that better or different from the usual virus test? The usual virus test called PCR test, you got to amplify the genetic material. You have to put it through cycles of hot and cold, hot and cold. If you've got a direct test using CRISPR, and there are two great labs, one in Berkeley, that's Jennifer Doudna's, and then Fong Zhang's and MIT, that kind of rivals on both coasts. They both developed it where it can just go in and use a detection technology to see if the genetic sequences are there. And so you can program it in for the genetic uh, sequences of the COVID-19 virus but you could also program it for the next virus that comes along, or for SARS or MERS, or for that matter, the flu or anything else. So it will be a wonderful uh, detection technology that you can use for any viruses that come along. Well, and I know that CRISPR is also talked about as a way to detect cancer and to help even, you know, help us find a real cure for different kinds of cancers. Where does that stand? What, what it can do is turn genes on and off. We have genes in our body that can help suppress the spread of tumors. We have genes that cause sometimes a uh, cell to uh, go out of control and become cancerous. So you could use CRISPR in the future, not right now, but you could use it in the future to turn on and off genes that help cause cancer. And for that matter, to create kids that are less susceptible to cancer. Elephants don't get cancer. They have a P53 gene. If you want to engineer those in, you could help the human race not be susceptible to viruses, not be susceptible to cancer. And I will say that China is way ahead of us, about three years ahead of us on using this for cancer. Well, I was, gonna, I was just gonna ask about, about China and also some of the ethical issues. But first, just getting back to that cancer, uh, and and how to you know turn off turn off those those cells that end up you know causing the cancers? How far away do we think that is for just regular use? You know, if if it, you go to the hospital, this would be part of your treatment. We're already in clinical trials for some forms of cancer suppression. As you know very well, Susan, cancer is not a disease. Cancer is hundreds and thousands of different diseases, all changing and all personal. So at the moment, CRISPR is mainly being used for sickle cell anemia, for other blood diseases, for congenital blindness, but it's also now starting to be used in clinical trials, meaning it's got to get through these trials this year, but maybe by next year or the year after, we'll start seeing it as a therapy in hospitals. 
Well, that, that would be great. You know, you mentioned how China is ahead of us and how in the future we might be able to program, um, you know, I guess unborn children, right, to be less susceptible uh, to cancers. What are the, let's talk about the ethical issues uh, raised by that because, you know, that's, I guess, a good use, but there might be some other uses, uh, you know, uh, to change the, the genes of children uh, or I guess before they're born, right? To, right? to have different characteristics. So talk about the ethics of all of this. Yeah, Jennifer Dowd, who's the um, character in my book, which by the way, won't be published until March, but I'm just turning it in this week, as you said at the beginning. But Jennifer Dowd has been leading the effort to try to think through some of these moral issues. But let's do it as we would at Aspen. You figure it out, you say, well, first of all, let's say you could just fix that one letter mutation that causes sickle cell. Wouldn't you do it in your children? The answer is, yeah, yeah, of course. I, there's no upside to having sickle cell. Right. If that matter, cystic fibrosis. Or worse yet, Huntington's disease, which is right. just a devastating thing that's going to kill you by age 50 in a slow, painful way. And those are simple genetic mutations that run in families. And you could edit them out of your family, and you get edited them out of the human species. All right, let's take the next step. Should we um, edit genes so that people can be taller? Well, we that, that starts getting pretty tricky, right? You know, all of us would like to be, or many of us anyway, I'd like to be a little taller, but is that really what we should be doing? No, and it also is something that doesn't advantage the entire human race. We all got six inches taller, None of us would actually be better off unless you have a job raising the door jams in people's houses. Uh, but likewise, you can tweak things that will affect memory. That's pretty easily understood, the genetic components of that. So would you want your kids to have a better memory or eventually a better general intelligence? Those are things that could be good, but we're not sure we want to barrel down the slippery slope where society allows rich people to buy good genes for their children, and it's only, as, as Algis Huxley wrote about in Brave New World, you get two types of society, the genetically enhanced and the non, or the movie Gattaca, for those who haven't read Brave New World. It is a good question. Where does that start once you, <clears throat> I mean, excuse me, where does that stop once you start it, right? You know, you could be taller, you could be smarter, you could be stronger, maybe, you could, but what, it, where does all of that go? Sports. I mean, if people, are, you know, sports fanatics are doing muscles, that's real easy. There's a gene that stops muscle growth at a certain time when we become mature. If you just tweak that on and off, myostatin. In fact, some of the biohackers, as a biohacker I've uh, interviewed for the book, he's been doing it to himself, just plunging a syringe to turn off the myostatin gene. So if you've got a kid who wants to play, you know, basketball, baseball, football, whatever, you'd be tempted to, you know, enhance them for muscles. Those are the type of things we'll be able to do. It won't happen for the next five or 10 or maybe 15 years, but I think we got to start figuring it out now. Do you expect that by the time we're ready uh, to be able to do those things, there will be a set of rules that goes along with, you know, along with this ability, or are we going to have the ability before we have the rules? You know, science has always progressed and it tries to keep in tandem with our moral processing power. Every now and then we don't quite get it right. We do something like invent an atom bomb and we haven't yet morally processed what are the rules of the road for that one. I'm hoping that by reading about CRISPR and gene editing, we can have a good societal discussion to say, what should the rules of the road be? And um, I suspect it's gonna be hard to have one set of regulations our friend Peggy Hamburg, who was at Aspen Ideas Festival quite a bit over the past few years, she's a co-chair of the World Health Organization, looking at how do we create these rules. She said, you know, you can't enforce it. My, the character I talked about, Josiah Zayner, he does it in his garage. So it's going to be hard. It's not like an atom bomb where you can put a padlock on a nuclear reactor. Uh, it's going to be hard to police it, but I think we're going to have to. Well, and I think that brings us back to something you mentioned earlier, which was China and how far ahead they are of us in, you know, creating this technology and, and beginning to put it to use. You know, could you see a situation where 
China's got one set of ethical rules and we've got another and maybe, you know, other countries have, have their own? Will it all be different depending on where you live? Well, Peggy Hamburg said there will probably be what biologists call a mosaic. It'll be different. Just like in Europe, you can't have genetically modified organisms, you know, in your agriculture supply as much as we can. But let's get to China right away. China does have restrictions, but very famously, very explosively, the first CRISPR babies were born in China in November 2018. It surprised everybody. It was sort of a rogue scientist who knew how to do CRISPR, was at a fertility clinic, and he was able to genetically engineer twin girls that are alive today that have the receptor for HIV, the virus that causes AIDS, cut out of them. And so that it's been edited out of them and their children and all their descendants, they won't have a receptor for HIV. So China has already done it. Now, to make it complicated, China's put the guy in jail too, said it was unauthorized. So not only do you have to have rules that China and everybody's gonna have to agree with, but you gotta be able to police rogue scientists. Do you know, um, do we know how those kids are doing? I mean, are they okay, these babies? We don't know very much, and boy, I've, I've gotten as much as I can for the book. They're a couple years old, the edits were not perfect, meaning they were, as I said, mosaics, that some cells escaped at it. It also wasn't medically necessary. There are other ways to prevent AIDS than editing out this receptor gene. But as far as we know, the twin girls are still alive and uh, I hope they're being studied because even though I think it was an outrage to do this before the timing was right and the safety was right, it'd be interesting to at least be able to get the medical data from how they're maturing. It would, and you know, you also have to wonder: was that really the only adaptation made to their, you know, to their genes? Well, one of the difficult things is when you have a gene like the CCR5 gene that has a receptor for HIV. That CCR5 gene sometimes does other things. There's indication that it makes you less immune to West Nile disease if you have it. So before we go tinkering with Mother Nature, it'd be useful to understand her. That, that is for sure. I'd like to talk for a second uh, a little more about Jennifer Doudna herself. Uh, I've had the pleasure also of, of talking to her for a book that we did at National Geographic, a, bo a book about women and groundbreaking women. And one of the things that she said to me was, you know, how the biggest hurdle that she had to overcome in her life and her efforts to become a scientist was really her own insecurity, that she just wasn't sure as a young woman you know, growing up, whether she really had it in her to be this amazing scientist that she has turned out to be. Did she talk with you about any of that kind of thing? Totally, and that's one of the great themes of the book because she's a pioneering woman scientist. And as I've written books about, you know, everybody from Einstein on back to, uh, you know, Franklin and Leonardo, the pioneers of science who are women don't usually get as much attention and they don't usually get as much encouragement. When Jennifer was growing up in Hilo, Hawaii, uh, she was sort of an outsider in Hawaii, but suddenly she learned to love nature, how the shy grass, it's called, would curl when you touched it, or why there were sort of eyeless uh, creatures and spiders in the caves, the lava caves of Hawaii. So she tells her advisor at high school she wants to become a scientist. And what does the guy tell her? Women don't become scientists. So your insecurity gets to start. But fortunately, her dad pushed her very hard. And her dad loved the idea that she was going to become a scientist. So yeah, she's filled, like we all probably are, with insecurities. And part of it is, can a woman become a scientist? Well, and I'm, I'm so delighted that you've decided to tell her story. I mean, if I, if I have this right, she's the first woman whose story you've really had the opportunity to tell? Or you've, is that right? Absolutely. And, you know, she has helped mentor other women as well. And one of the wonderful things is if you look at the CRISPR field, it's collaborative, but a lot of them are women. You know, they did go into the life sciences. And a lot of the women were excluded from the hunt for DNA during the Human Genome Project, you know, led by Jim Watson and Francis Collins and Eric Landers, all sort of a male, alpha male thing. And so these women started studying RNA, 
which is by far the more interesting cousin to DNA because it actually does work in the body. It goes out and builds the proteins that the DNA encode. And so it's Jillian Banfield out in California, Emmanuel Charpentier, who becomes a partner uh, from born in Paris and living in Vienna, and a group of other women who uh, pushed forth this genetic revolution to have gene editing. Well, it's, it's really an encouraging story, and I hope a lot of young women will be encouraged by Jennifer's story. Jennifer, let me mention on that, because Jennifer told me that when she was in middle school, her father put a paperback on her bed, and the paperback was The Double Helix by Jim Watson. And, and young Jennifer thought it was some detective or mystery story. And when she read it, she suddenly realized it is a detective and mystery story. It's about science, and that turned her on. But there's a character called, you know, named Rosalind Franklin, who never gets the credit she deserves for having done the photo that leads to the discovery of the structure of DNA. And what Jennifer said is by reading that book on my bedside when I was a middle schooler, it turned me on to the mystery and the detective hunt of science and also told me women could do it. I hope some other middle school kids, boys and girls, you know, pick up my book or other books like mine and say, yeah, I'm going to do that as well. Because in the age of coronavirus, those are the type of people we need. Well, that's for sure. And we need, we need all the help we can get. You know, finally, I remember Jennifer telling me she thought the characteristic that got her through, um, you know, got her through it whenever she was sort of feeling down or insecure was her own stubbornness. And did, did that come out to you? She's very stubborn. She's very persistent. I don't know if she told you, but she's also very competitive. Uh, sometimes people like to hide how competitive they are. But to me, it's a great trait in her. And that stubbornness and persistence said, look, I'm going to overcome this. She felt actually an outsider because she was an Anglo in a all Polynesian and Hawaiian community. She was a woman trying to do science. And look, one of the things you learn in science is you got to persist. Well, she's a, she's a terrific character, and I'm glad that uh, your book is going to bring her story to, uh, you know, to the general public's attention. I mean, this really is one of the greatest breakthroughs in the last century. So, Walter, it has been a delight to talk to you today about Jennifer Doudna, and I really look forward to, uh, to reading your story. Thank you so much, Susan. Appreciate Thanks, Walter. It.